I'll be showing a video in 12 chapters, and we'll stop after each chapter, and then I will, again, review the highlights of what we looked at in the video. Uh, and if you just look at the video and listen to me, I'm probably going to give you a lot of information that you'll see later today. Essentially, I have somewhat of a key book up here that has some of the more important information in it. So uh, whatever you do, if you want to take a few notes, that's fine, but don't just simply uh, go into a, a writing uh, craze because the book has already been written, so you don't really need to rewrite the book. But uh, I will, if I make a comment such as you'll probably see this later today, or this is important, or this is something you need to remember, that's probably, um, you might want to make a note of that, and that's something you probably will see. Those of you that brought your books, you may want to turn over to uh, the very first chapter called Principles of Pest Control. Uh, and if you've got a little highlighter or something, you might put a check or highlight or something uh, under some of the comments that I make. But with that, we'll go ahead and turn the video on. Uh, we can get the lights down just a little bit. And we will begin on, um, we will begin now with chapter one, Principles of Pest Control. Principles of Pest Control. A pest is anything that competes with humans, domestic animals, or desirable plants for food and water, injures humans, animals, desirable plants, or structures, spreads disease to humans, domestic animals, or desirable plants, or annoys humans or domestic animals. There are several major types of pests. There are insects that feed on plants, our buildings, animals, and sometimes us. Mites that feed on plants and animals, and ticks that feed on animals only. Microbial organisms such as bacteria, fungi, and viruses that can cause disease in plants or animals. Weeds, any plants that grow where they're not wanted, such as this crabgrass. Mollusks or snails and slugs that feed on plants. Vertebrates such as rats and mice that consume our food and carry disease. And nematodes, worms such as these, seen feeding on a root hair of a plant. The first step in any pest control program is to correctly identify the pest. If you need aid in identification, your county extension agent or land-grant university can help. There are three different goals in pest control. These are prevention, keeping a pest from creating a problem. For example, prevention could involve guarding a plant against a fungus disease. Suppression, reducing the pest to an acceptable level, and eradication, destroying all members of a pest species over a wide area. This is being done with a boll weevil, which devastated cotton crops in some southern states. When pest control is needed, you should plan a pest control strategy that will work and aim the control, where possible, at the pest only. Thresholds are levels of pest populations at which you should take pest control action if you want to prevent pests in an area from causing unacceptable injury or harm. The amount of damage that is considered unacceptable is often defined by economic effect, so this is often referred to as an economic threshold. The peaches on the right receive preventive chemical control to protect them from a bacterial disease. The peaches on the left received no treatment. Here, a crop pest scout is examining weed seed so a proper pest identification and control recommendation can be made. Remember, the first step in any pest control program is to identify pests, and then thresholds tell whether action is needed. So you should monitor pests to determine kinds of pests, numbers present, the best time to begin control. This depends on the developmental stage of the plant and the pest, and the efficacy of control efforts. Pest control involves more than simply identifying and controlling a pest. You should be aware of and avoid potential harmful effects to non-target areas. Here is a bee kill caused by drift when the wind was in the wrong direction. 
Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, is the combining of several pest control tactics into a single plan to reduce pests to an acceptable level. This often involves delaying use of a pesticide to allow naturally occurring parasites and predators to reduce the pest population. Here is a destructive hornworm pest that has been infested with a parasitic wasp. In addition to natural enemies, other natural controls that act independently of humans can cause pest populations to rise and fall. These include climate and availability of food, water, and shelter. Mountains and plains can be natural controls that make geographic barriers to pests. When natural controls are not adequate to control a pest, humans can select applied controls. Those available include plant resistance, effective against certain insects or disease. Biological organisms, some viruses or bacteria such as Bacillus thuringiensis, can be used as an insecticide. Cultural methods such as the time of planting or crop rotation, mechanical methods such as screens or traps. Sanitation measures, Proper storage and disposal of organic wastes, as at this sanitary landfill, is a method of pest control. And chemical control, the use of pesticides to destroy, attract, or repel pests. Pesticides are usually the fastest way to control pests, and in many instances they may be the only tactic available. Sometimes you may find that even though you apply a pesticide, the pest is not controlled. Some of the reasons for failure can be pest resistance, incorrect pesticide selection, incorrect dose or timing, incorrect pest identification, improper equipment or calibration, and infestation after controls have been applied. A pesticide that is usually effective failed to control these corn earworms. Each time a pesticide is used, it selectively kills the most susceptible pests. Pests that are not destroyed may pass along to their offspring the trait that allowed them to survive. This is called pest resistance. Pest resistance to a chemical is more likely to develop when the same pesticide is used over a wide geographic area or when a pesticide is applied repeatedly to a rather small area where pest populations are isolated. Rotating types of pesticides and reducing frequency of application help to reduce the development of pest resistance. Remember, several different ways to control a pest problem. Where possible, it is usually best to use a combination of control methods and not depend entirely on chemicals. To simplify information, trade name products and equipment are shown on this and the following slide sets in this training session. No endorsement is intended nor is criticism implied of similar products or equipment which are not shown. We're going to start with principles of pest control in chapter one. Those of you that have your book, you might want to follow along and you can underline some of the comments that I'll make. Um, we always want to look at the very first chapter, or I'm sorry, the very first sentence in each chapter because that uh, gives us a good lead in of what we're going to talk about in this chapter and it's usually a test question too. So if we're looking at the very first chapter, Principles of Pest Control, let's take a look at that very first paragraph in that very first chapter. A pest is anything that competes with humans, domestic animals, or desirable plants for food or water. A pest is anything that injures humans, animals, desirable plants, spreads disease, annoys humans, etc. So you might want to put a little check by that if you have your books, or just remember that. Log that into your uh, memory banks up here, because that may be a test question. A pest is anything that, and so forth. Also, just below that, the types of pests. This is usually on the test. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, but it would uh, pay you to remember the different types of pests. We have insect pests, insect-like organisms, microbes, and this includes nematodes and diseases, fungi, bacterial diseases, etc., weeds, mollusks, 
and vertebrates. Now you know the difference between an insect and an insect-like organism? Because that might be on the test too. If you remember from basic entomology, what, insects have what, three body parts and six legs? And insect-like organisms, what they're referring to there are ticks, um, specifically ticks, and other insect-like organisms, spiders, two body parts and eight legs. So do remember that. And that'll be uh, mentioned again this afternoon in the entomology section. Okay? Over on the next page, they talk about pest control goals. If you'll turn over to page four, again, I'm just giving you some highlights of the chapters as we go along through the book, things that you're likely to see a little bit later today. Pest control goals, there are three pest control goals. You have prevention, suppression, and eradication. Prevention, keeping a pest from becoming a problem. You might use a pre-emerge product to keep bluegrass down. That's prevention of a weed problem. Suppression, reducing pest numbers or damage to an acceptable level. You might use a, an insecticide to, to kill aphids on roses. You're probably not gonna kill them all, but you're at least gonna reduce the number to an acceptable level. Then eradication, we may use a product like glyphosate or Roundup, and we may take out an entire uh, vegetative area just to replant in a lawn. So those are the examples of pest control goals. Sometimes that pops up on the test. Prevention, suppression, and eradication. They also talked about threshold levels in the video. And on page four, uh, down in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a definition of threshold level. A lot of this test is just simple definition. It's not that hard, it's just simple definition. But what is a threshold level? Thresholds are levels of pest populations at which you should take pest control action. I don't know if some of you work on a golf course and you do a tri-cut out on the fairway and roll that turf back and if you see six grubs per square foot, six grubs might be the threshold for taking some type of pesticide action. It may be six, it may be seven or eight, but that's an example of a threshold level. A number at which you've got to do something. You've got to take some type of action. Okay, that's a threshold level. Um, over on page six, and I can almost guarantee you this will be on the test, if you saw the big letters IPM on the test and they ask you, IPM stands for, what would you say? What would you say to that? Integrated Pest Management? That's the correct answer. That's probably going to be on the test. I don't know how they'll phrase the question, I don't know what form it'll come in, but if you see the big letters, capital letters IPM, integrated pest management, and, or they may ask, what is integrated pest management? And that's a combining of appropriate pest control tactics into a single plan. And in the book, you see the clip art here, they give you an example. Legal control, sanitation techniques, cultural controls, resistant varieties, mechanical, physical uh, tactics, and even pesticides. They all form, come together to form what we call integrated pest management. And pesticides are part of that plan. We also mentioned uh, some examples of natural controls like climate. Uh, natural enemies would include birds and reptiles and so forth. Also at the very end, uh, toward the end of this chapter, there's a term called pheromone. Pheromone. Do you see that on page seven over on the right column about halfway down? Pheromone. And you may think, hmm, I've heard that name Somewhere, pheromone, pheromone, but I just can't remember. If you'll go back to the beginning of the chapter, there's a little section called Terms to Know, and we'll review some of the terms, uh, or many of the terms, in this little gray block called Terms to Know. But do you see the word pheromone there? They may ask you on the test, what is a pheromone? Chemicals emitted by an organism to influence the behavior of other organisms of the same species. It's like a Japanese beetle trap. You have a pheromone, at least one, maybe two or three, and the beetle is attracted to the trap. It actually buzzes along, hits that plastic plate, and drops in the bag. But it's a pheromone that actually attracts the Japanese beetle, or a yellow jacket trap, something like that. That's the definition of a pheromone. So you may see that on the test as well. One last um, comment in this chapter on page nine, and on the video they did talk a little bit briefly about pests pesticide control failures. Why would we not uh, successfully control an insect, for instance? Or why did our pest control t uh, procedure fail? Well, the pesticide may have been old. We may have used the wrong pesticide. We may have used 
not enough pesticide. There are a number of reasons that we could have had a pest uh, control failure. But the one comment that's circled in my book here that they may ask you on the test, when, and it's in the middle column, about um, up near the top, when one pesticide is used repeatedly in the same place against the same pest over and over and over and over again, and in many cases homeowners will do this, they'll buy one bottle of one pesticide, malathion seven, and they'll use it over and over and over again. So finally the, the insect essentially becomes tolerant to it, may even start to, to eat it. It's just, uh, it becomes very tolerant to that pesticide. So essentially you get a pest control failure. But there are a number of reasons we have pest control failure. So do remember that. Do remember the term pheromone, integrated pest management, what IPM stands for, pest control goals, threshold levels, Remember types of pest and what a pest is. And also remember that accurate identification is the first step in an effective pest management program. That's back on page three in the middle column. That may pop up on the test. What is the first step in an effective pest management program? Accurate identification. If we're, if we're trying to control an insect with a fungicide, what's gonna happen? Not much. We're not going to control an insect with fungicide. But you would be amazed at how many people think if they just have a product on the shelf that's got a picture of a pest on it, or it says pesticide, it will work against all pests, and that's not the answer. Remember in terms to know, pheromone, also put a little check mark by the very first term in that block there, that gray block, called host, H-O-S-T, a plant or animal on or in which a pest lives. So those are the two terms from this chapter we need to remember, host and pheromone, okay? At the very end of the, very, very end of the chapter, there's a section called test your knowledge. You may want to look at this section during breaks or during lunch and then go back and review the terms and terms to know. And then I will discuss or reinforce some of the material that pops up on the video, uh, in the video, uh, in the chapter itself, in the chapter review. With that, we're going to move over to chapter two. Pesticide labeling, this is the procedure we're going to use this morning. Now chapter one was the shortest chapter in the book, so that went by very quickly. That went by very fast. So as we proceed through the book, the chapters are going to get longer and longer and longer, so that's why we have to keep moving along. But those of you that have your book, you may want to turn over to chapter two, pesticide labeling. We'll look at the video and then we'll go back through a, re a video review uh, process after we look at the video. Pesticide labeling. The label is the information printed on or attached to the pesticide container. Labeling includes the label plus all other information you receive from the manufacturer on how to use the product. Read all brochures, leaflets, and any supplemental information from the EPA. For example, the label may refer you to additional information on worker protection or endangered species. Labeling information is the result of years of scientific research on how to use the product most effectively and how the product affects humans, animals, plants, and other parts of the environment. All pesticides must be registered by the EPA as a part of the process, EPA must determine that the product will not present unreasonable risks to humans or the environment if used as directed on the label. There are three major types of pesticide registration. Federal registration, special local needs registration, and emergency exemption. Federal EPA registrations are most common. Special local needs registration allows a state to add additional uses to an already registered pesticide. Emergency exemptions are used to allow quick, temporary approval when an emergency pest situation arises for which no pesticide is already registered. Here are the labels from three pesticides. The one on the lower right is classified as a restricted use pesticide. The other two are not designated for restricted use, so they are called unclassified. The restricted use pesticide designation is always in a box at the top of the front panel on the pesticide label. 
Restricted use pesticides are those pesticides that could cause harm to humans or to the environment unless applied by certified applicators who have the knowledge to use them safely and effectively. Pesticides that are not restricted are unclassified. Examples of environmental reasons why a pesticide might be restricted are that it may be very toxic to fish or that it has characteristics that would allow it to get into groundwater. In addition to environmental concerns, pesticides can be classified for restricted use if they are known to be acutely toxic to humans or, as shown here, if long-time exposure will cause tumors or other adverse effects in laboratory animals. Only a certified pesticide applicator can use or supervise someone else to use a restricted use pesticide. There are two types of certification, private and commercial. Private applicators are those who use pesticides on their own or another's land to raise an agricultural commodity. They can trade services, but they cannot charge a fee and remain private applicators. Commercial applicators are all others who don't fit the private applicator definition. Shown here are two brand name formulations of glyphosate, more commonly known by one of its brand names, Roundup. The only way you can be sure that two products contain the same active ingredient is to compare the common name, if there is one, or the chemical name in the active ingredient statement. You cannot depend on brand, trade, or product names. Information on the label is grouped under various headings to make it easier to find the information you need. The active ingredient statement will give you the common name, if there is one, and the chemical name. In this example, galactothion is the common name. The front panel of the pesticide label tells you how much is in the container. This can be expressed as pounds or ounces for dry formulations, or as gallons, pints, or fluid ounces for liquids. There's usually a short statement on the front panel that tells what type of pests the product will control. The kind of formulation the product is will usually be noted on the front panel. You need to know what letter abbreviations stand for, such as WP for wettable powder, G for granule, or EC for emulsifiable concentrate. Signal words, danger, warning, or caution are on the front panel of the label and indicate how toxic the product is to humans. The words danger poison appearing together and with the skull and crossbones symbol indicate high toxicity. A product labeled in this way is likely to cause acute illness through oral, dermal, or inhalation exposure. The word danger without the word poison following it and without the skull and crossbones indicates the product can cause skin or eye irritation. The signal word warning indicates moderate toxicity and the word caution signals that the product is slightly toxic. Most pesticide products will have a section statements of practical treatment and may include a note to physician statement. This section will give you first aid instructions for someone who has been exposed. The label or labeling will contain statements that indicate which route of entry, mouth, skin, eyes, or lungs, you must particularly protect, and what actions you need to take to avoid acute effects or toxicity from exposure. The label will also tell you what personal protective equipment you will need to protect yourself. Sometimes the statements will require different personal protective equipment for different pesticide handling activities. For example, more personal protective equipment may be required while mixing concentrates than while spraying the diluted mixture from an enclosed cab. In addition to acute effects of exposure, the label may warn you of chronic or delayed effects for repeated exposure over a long period of time. Chronic effects could include tumors or genetic changes. A label may note that repeated exposure has caused reproductive problems in laboratory animals. 
If tests or other data indicate the pesticide product has the potential to cause allergic effects, such as skin irritation or asthma, the product labeling must state that fact. This section will indicate precautions needed for protecting the environment. For example, this product is toxic to fish and wildlife. Its label warns that wind drift or water runoff could kill birds or fish near treated areas. If there are any physical or chemical hazards associated with the product, such as flammability, this section will warn you. Under the directions for use will be the statement, it is a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. This includes using the product on a crop or site not listed on the label. The directions for use will include specific instructions on how to use the product. For example, plants, animals, or sites on which you can use the pesticide will be listed. Restrictions may prohibit using the product through an irrigation system or applying it by air. You may be directed to post treated fields, barring people from entering a treated area without protective clothing until a specified amount of time has passed. Storage instructions will inform you of any special storage requirements, such as do not store below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And there will be instructions on how to dispose of the container. In this slide, the applicator is triple rinsing the container and will add the rinse to the spray tank. Federal law does allow you to use pesticides in some ways not specifically mentioned on the labeling, you may apply the pesticide on target pests not listed on the label as long as the crop or site is listed. Apply at any dosage or concentration less than that on the label. Apply the pesticide less often than listed on the label. Use any equipment or method of application not prohibited on the label. For example, Many labels now prohibit applying the product through an irrigation system, but other permissible application methods may not be listed. And you may mix two or more pesticides in the same tank mix, if not prohibited by the labeling. Remember, the label on the container may direct you to other important sources of information. One sentence or paragraph on a pesticide label may be the only notice you will receive that additional use directions are required in order for the product to be used in compliance with its labeling. Read all labeling carefully. All right, now we're over in chapter two. If you want to turn your uh, book over to pesticide labeling in chapter two, we'll take a few minutes to review some of the things we looked at in the video and some of the material in the book. Again, I'm going to direct you to the very first paragraph because that's a good, uh, of course, lead in to what we're going to talk about, but there's usually, uh, in many cases, a test question or two that comes from the paragraph, the very first paragraph in each chapter. This paragraph uh, or chapter begins by saying pesticide product labeling is the main method of communication between a pesticide manufacturer and pesticide user, so you want to remember that. What's the main method of communication between the pesticide Manufacturing the user? Labeling. The labeling. All right, that brings us to another point. Just below that in the bold print, and anytime you see something in bold, you'll want to make a little mental note of that because you might see that later on the test too. Do you see there where it says label and labeling? Label and labeling? Until I started teaching this class 18 years ago, it was about 18, about almost 20 years ago that I started teaching these classes, and I've done well over 100 of these very classes like this one today all over the state. See the word label and labeling? I never really realized there was a difference in label and labeling. Label, labeling, it's all the same thing, right? Well, not really. So sometimes people will say the test might be a little tricky. This is an example of what they mean by, quote, tricky. Label, that's the information printed on or attached to the pesticide container, can, bottle, box. Smack, that's what you're gonna see on the side of the box. That's the label. That might be a test question. Now that's a little bit different from labeling, and you say, well, how is that? Because that's what I said. Labeling not only includes the label itself, but all other information you might get from the manufacturer. And that might be a CD, it might be a video, it might be a booklet, 
It could be notes, it could be anything. It could be a handbook. So just remember, there is a difference in label and labeling, and sometimes that pops up on the test. So don't get caught on that one. Label, it's attached to the box, can, container, et cetera. Labeling, that's everything you get. It may, it's the label plus anything else you get. So do keep that in mind. Over on page uh, four and five, they go into the different classifications of pesticide uses, and they mention this in the video. We have unclassified, and we have restricted use pesticides. In other words, we have non-restricted pesticides and we have restricted pesticides. Uh, all pesticides we need to be careful with, but especially the restricted use pesticides. But again, we need to be careful with all of them. So remember, we have unclassified or non-restricted pesticides. Anybody can buy that. You can go into a Kroger and buy that or a hardware store. Then we have restricted use pesticides, which you have to have the permit for. We also have two types of applicators. We have private applicators and we have commercial applicators. All of you here today are commercial applicators. Steve, Todd, and I, uh, back when I was an extension agent, we would, we would train private applicators in the extension office. And these are, for the most part, farmers and some homeowners. Homeowners can purchase restricted pesticides. We don't like for homeowners to, to buy restricted pesticides especially, but they have that right. If they can find it and if they can afford it, they can buy it. Farmers also uh, are considered private applicators where they're uh, not applying a pesticide to the land of another for a fee, okay? And I got a feeling I just lost the microphone because it's not coming across anymore. Todd, I think that brought it back up. Commercial applicators like yourself, uh, people that are applying pesticides on the land of another, usually for a fee, unless maybe you work for the parks and recreation. And back in the 70s when I worked for parks and recreation, I had to go through this commercial test. Even though I was not a business or a company, the uh, city of Athens felt that it would be better for me to go through the commercial rating than the private rating. So some of you may be with a golf course or maybe with a parks and rec department or something like that, or a lot of you are with a business, I'm sure. But do remember, private applicators, commercial applicators, okay? Moving right along on page five, parts of the pesticide label. We could spend the rest of the day on this if we wanted to, but I've got about three minutes to spend on this part. On the pesticide label itself, or labeling, what do you think you would see in the big letters? Big, big letters. The brand name, right. That's the trade name or the brand name. But we also have three names for every pesticide that you might use. We have a brand name, like maybe Depesto, or maybe Seven, or maybe Malathion, or whatever, whatever product you're using. We also have a chemical name. Over on page six, they give you some examples of chemical names, and these are the long scientific names, O-O-Diethyl, O-2-Isopropyl, that go on and on and on. That's the chemical name. We don't normally, or I don't, and I don't think you do either, talk about products in chemical terms. It just takes too long, and nobody can remember all that O-O-Diethyl, unless you're a chemist, they, they uh, talk to each other in those terms. But we normally use a common name. So rather than O-O-Diethyl, O-O, we may um, say seven, or we may say um, malathion, or we may say cyfluthrin, or something, dimethrin, something like that, permethrin. So remember, we have a trade name, we have a chemical name, and we have a common name. That may pop up on the test. We also have registration numbers, or a registration number. This is what information you might see on the label. The name and address of the manufacturer, net contents, the type of pesticide will be listed on the label. It'll tell you if it's an insecticide, a herbicide, a fungicide, a bactericide. The type of formulation will be on the label or in the labeling. And if you see the big letters WP, wettable powder, D, dust, EC, emulsible concentrate, which is a liquid. So you'll see the type of formulation, okay? Another point, and this will probably pop up on the test, on page seven at the very top left-hand corner, if you have your book, you might wanna look at that. Red, uh, restricted use designation. When a product is restricted, note what it says here in this paragraph. When a pesticide is classified as restricted, the label or labeling will state that. It will say restricted use pesticide in a box. This is the important part, in a box at the top of the front panel. So on the test, if you have the question with A, B, C, D, four answers, and it says, uh, in a box at the bottom of the back panel, is that correct? 
No. Why is that not correct? Because it's a box in the top of the front panel. So that's the kind of questions now that you might see. So just be alert to these little word changes and so forth. Just remember, it will say, if it's a restricted product, restricted use pesticide, pesticide, it will be in a box at the top of the front panel, okay? So don't be uh, tricked on some of those things. Also, just something you can commit to memory. Whether you were going through this class today or not, you just need to know this. Down on about the middle of page seven, in the middle column actually, and down toward the bottom, they talk about signal words and symbols. This is something you just need to know, and a lot of you probably already know this. We have three signal words. We have the signal word danger, we have the signal word warning, and we have the signal word caution. Now, if you see the signal word danger on a product, danger, you will also see the skull and crossbones. Again, you need to be careful with all of them, but you need to be extremely careful with anything that says danger and has the skull and crossbones. Because as it says here, the danger word, this signals that the pesticide is highly toxic. This product is very likely to cause acute illness from oral dermal inhalation exposure, or it may cause severe eye or skin inhalation. It doesn't take a lot, and it happens real fast. If you're careless with it, it, it could be very um, unfortunate. You might end up in the hospital in the emergency room. You could have some problems very quickly if you see the danger word with, with the skull and crossbones. Okay, the next word they want you to remember uh, in the video, <clears throat> in the chapter here, is the warning word, warning. This word signals that the product is moderately toxic. It can cause acute illness, and acute means now, means right away, A-C-U-T-E. That means right now, this minute. So that's the warning word, can cause some problems. And then caution, uh, if you see that word on the product, that means that the particular product is slightly toxic or relatively non-toxic. And you'll see this used on a lot of the homeowner products that, you, like I say, you can buy in a grocery store or a hardware store or a retail store, something like that. Caution. So do remember, danger. And a question they usually ask with the danger is what accompanies the danger word, and that's the skull and crossbones. Then we have warning and we also have caution. Okay? Um, if we go over to page nine, you'll see other statements, uh, comments that are on the label, environmental hazard statements such as, uh, do not use this pesticide near water, streams, lakes, etc. Physical, chemical hazard statements might be on there. Uh, directions for use, of course, are always there. Allergic effect statements, personal protective equipment statements. And we've got a whole chapter on personal uh, protective equipment coming up. There may be a reentry statement uh, on the label. How much time must pass before you can reenter a treated area? Storage and disposal statements. Those are just some of the things you might see on the label or in the labeling. But do remember the three words, caution, uh, caution and warning and danger. And do remember the trade name and the common name and the chemical name, restricted use pesticides, non-restricted pesticides, private applicators, commercial applicators. There's a difference in label and labeling. Do remember that. Um, very beginning of the chapter, again, we'll go through some of the terminology under terms to know. There's a little block, a gray block at the beginning of each chapter. And I'll, I'll highlight the words for you. And before we get to the end of the review, there'll be a number of words. There'll probably be 50 words that you, you really need to know. Acute effects, the very first word, terms to know. A-C-U-T-E, acute effects. That may pop up on the test as a question. What is an acute effect? And they'll give you several answers, probably four. Two answers usually are just obviously wrong. They're just not right. You'll know that. Two answers are pretty good answers, but there's one best answer on all of these questions. Just this one best answer. Acute effects, illnesses or injuries that may appear immediately, that's right now, after exposure to a pesticide. Usually within 24 hours, but it's usually immediately. That's an acute effect. And they usually ask that on the test. Allergic effects, that's the very next term to know. Harmful effects such as skin rash, asthma, breathing problems, et cetera, that some people develop in reaction to pesticides. I have that problem with certain insecticides that just developed just in the last five years. Never, ever had any problems before. Just with certain insecticides, and it's just an allergic effect, and it affects my breathing. Delayed effects, illnesses or injuries that do not appear immediately, usually not within 24 hours. It may be days, it may be weeks later, 
but that's called a delayed effect or a chronic effect. They may ask you on the test, a chronic effect is a what? Delayed effect, does not occur immediately. So do remember acute effects, allergic effects, and delayed effects. So that's just a little bit of uh, what you need to know in chapter two on pesticide labeling. Again, there's, we could spend all day just on one chapter, but we just don't have the time, but I'm giving you the high points. In chapter two, they did mention formulations just very, very briefly. So if you turn over to chapter three, that will be the entire topic of chapter three, formulations. So turn over to chapter three if you wanna follow along through the book. I'll turn the video on and when we're finished, we'll do a little bit of a review there on chapter three, formulations. Formulations. The active ingredient is the chemical that controls the pest. The inert ingredients are used for a variety of purposes, to dilute the pesticide or to make it safer, more effective, easier to measure, mix and apply, or more convenient to handle. The mixture of active and inactive ingredients is called the pesticide formulation. A single active ingredient is often sold in several different formulations. Each has certain advantages and disadvantages. You need to select the formulation that is best for your particular application. Formulations may come in dry or liquid forms. Liquid formulations are normally diluted with water or other liquids before applying, or they are sometimes used as they come out of the container. Several of the more widely used liquid formulations and their label abbreviations are shown here. Emulsifiable concentrates are identified with a capital E or EC. The concentrates are easy to handle, require little agitation when mixed, leave little visible residue on treated surfaces, and are not abrasive to equipment. However, they may harm some plants and animals are easily absorbed through the skin and may be corrosive or flammable. The emulsifiable concentrate on the left is dark colored until mixed with water, then it turns a milky white. Ultra low volume or ULV pesticides are used in strong concentrations, up to 100% active ingredients, but are applied at rates of only a few ounces per acre. They are used as a space spray, such as for community mosquito control. Flowables, identified with a capital F or L, are insoluble solids that are finely ground and mixed with water to form a suspension. They are similar to ECs and wettable powders in ease of handling and use. They seldom clog nozzles and are easy to apply and handle, but require moderate agitation and may leave a visible residue. The formulation on the right is a ready-to-use aerosol. The container is under pressure that forces the pesticide through a fine opening, creating a cloud of small droplets. These aerosols are easy to use in enclosed areas and small areas outside but there is a risk of inhalation and they are hazardous if punctured or placed near an open flame. Other aerosol formulations are not under pressure, but are broken into a fine smoke or fog by a rapidly whirling disc or, as in this slide, by a heated surface. These aerosols provide an easy way to fill a space with insecticide, but it is difficult to confine the product to the target area and respiratory protection may be needed. Several of the more common dry formulations and their abbreviations are shown here. Dry refers to the state in the container. Dusts must be applied dry. Others, such as wettable powders, must be mixed with water before they are applied. Most dust formulations identified by D are ready to use and contain a low percentage of active ingredient. Advantages of dust include that they are ready to use, effective in sites where a liquid spray might cause damage, require simple application equipment, and are effective in hard-to-reach indoor areas. 
but there are disadvantages. Dusts easily move off target during application, as shown here. Do not stick to surfaces as well as liquids. Are difficult to distribute evenly and may irritate eyes, nose, throat, and skin. Granules identified with a G are also dry formulations used dry, but they consist of coarse particles. Like dusts, they are ready to use without mixing and can usually be applied with simple equipment. The drift hazard is low. However, they do not stick to foliage, may need moisture to start pesticidal action, and may be hazardous to birds that mistakenly feed on the grain or seed like granules. Granules are most often applied to soil for weeds and pest insects living in the soil. The bait, shown here, is a dry formulation used dry. Baits are made by mixing a pesticide with a food or substance attractive to the target pests. Baits kill pests when eaten. Wettable powders, identified by W or WP, are dry, finely ground formulations that look like dusts, but are higher concentrations that must be mixed with water. They are less likely than emulsifiable concentrates to harm plants, animals, or treated surfaces, but require constant agitation in the spray tank to keep them in suspension. Wettable powders are abrasive to pumps and nozzles, can clog nozzles and screens, leave a visible deposit, and are an inhalation hazard to the applicator when pouring and mixing the concentrated powder. Dry flowables, also called water dispensable granules, are identified as DF or WDG. These are also dry pesticide formulations applied as liquids, but they have larger particles than wettable powders. Like wettable powder formulations, they require constant agitation, but dry flowables are easier to mix and less likely to be inhaled. Fumigants are pesticides that form poisonous gases when applied. They are applied to enclosed or covered areas to prevent the gas from escaping. They are highly toxic to humans and require specialized protective and application equipment. An adjuvant is a chemical added to a pesticide formulation or tank mix to increase its effectiveness or safety. Most pesticide formulations contain at least a small percentage of adjuvants. Additional adjuvants may be added that may alter the dispersing, spreading, or other properties of the spray droplets. Shown here on the left is a pesticide formulation containing an active and inert ingredient. On the right is an adjuvant, which can be added to the tank mix to alter the spreading properties of spray droplets. Inert ingredients and adjuvants do many things to help the active ingredients do their jobs. These include acting as stickers, foaming agents, thickeners, compatibility agents, and buffers. An active ingredient often comes in more than one formulation. Formulations may be called liquid or dry, referring to the state in the container. Select the formulation best suited for your job. Again, we're going to go to the very first um, paragraph in this chapter because there's, it's just usually a question. So always go to the very first paragraph and read that paragraph anyway, because again, it's usually going to pull a question out of there. The active ingredients in a pesticide are the chemicals that control the target pest. So if they ask you on the test, what controls the target pest, and they have active ingredients, inactive ingredients, carriers, well, you'll know active ingredients uh, in the pesticide are the components that actually control the target pest. Now when you combine active ingredients with inactive ingredients, what do you have? That's a little bit further down in that, uh, it's actually in the second paragraph. The mixture of an active ingredient or active ingredients and inactive or inert ingredients is called a pesticide formulation. And they'll probably ask you that on the test. What is a pesticide formulation composed of? Active ingredients plus inactive ingredients or inert ingredients. Okay, we have, and with that said, we have three big blocks or groups of formulations. We have liquid formulations, which we'll talk about first. 
Then we have dry formulations. Then we have uh, gas or fumigant formulations. So just remember the big three are liquid formulations, dry formulations, and fumigants. They may ask you that on the test too. Those are the three formulations that we de deal with all the time. Before we get into that though, if you look over on page four, you'll see a big, big gray box right here. Abbreviations for formulations. Usually they'll pull a few of these on the test too. They may ask you if you see the big capital letter A, what does that stand for? What kind of formulation is that? That stands for what is it? Aerosol? Do you see where I'm talking about here in this block? Okay. If you go down through there and you see B, you might want to put a little check by A, which is aerosol, or B, which is bait, D, which is dust, E, or EC, that's emulsifiable concentrate, that's just a liquid, that's what that means. And if you go all the way to the bottom, you'll see uh, W or WP stands for wettable powder. So those are the ones that they may ask you on the test, what do those letters stand for? Okay, just a few comments about the liquid formulations, emulsifiable concentrates for the most part of what we're going to talk about, um, but we also have flowables and ultra low volume and some other types of liquid formulations, but for the most part, they'll key on emulsifiable concentrates, denoted by E, C, or E, if they ask you that on the test. And normally they will ask you, what are some of the advantages of, of the liquid or the emulsifiable concentrates and what are some of the disadvantages? That's usually where they're going to get the test questions. And as it says uh, here in the book, the advantages of the liquid formulations, the EC formulations, relatively easy to handle, transport and store, little agitation or no agitation required, not usually abrasive, uh, normally won't plug screens, nozzles, etc. cetera, L little visible residue uh, on treated surfaces because some people get very excited when they have a visible residue on their plant. They get extremely nervous and excited and may call you in the middle of the night and want you to come out there and fix that problem. I've been there before, many. Midnight. <laughs> disadvantages. What are disadvantages of uh, liquid formulations or emulsifiable concentrates? Uh, could cause harm if, if, all of them can cause harm if overused or overdosed, but especially the emulsifiable concentrates. If it says to use a pint and 50 gallons or two tablespoons and a gallon, and you triple or double that, you can get into some burn problems on a lot of sensitive plants or just any plant for that matter. Sometimes they're flammable, uh, but usually the phytotoxic uh, effect is what you need to be worried about. And they're a little bit more uh, easily absorbed through the skin, so you have to be a little bit more careful with liquid products. But those are just some of the disadvantages and advantages of the emulsifiable concentrates, which is primarily what we were going to key on in the liquid formulations. If we go over to the next page, page five, and you see dry formulations, you'll see dust, that's the first one they mention. Uh, they'll, you'll see baits, denoted by B. You'll see granules or granular products, denoted by G. Pellets, denoted by P, and wettable powders. Just a comment or two on, on dust. One of the uh, main disadvantages of a dust. What do you think a main disadvantage of a dust might be? Drift, exactly right, D-R-I-F-T. That's the movement of a product or pesticide off-site, off-target. You apply here at A, but it blows over through the wind currents to area B or C. And we can get into some real problems when we have drift occurring with pesticides, especially herbicides, when they drift off site and kill things that we don't uh, want to kill. So that's uh, something to note. The dry formulations are in the dust formulations, the drift hazard that they pose. All right, reversing that, going to a granular formulation then, what do you think is a major advantage of a granular formulation as a, when we're talking about drift? There's very little drift, and that's usually a test question. They'll, one way or another, they'll ask it to you. That the, the dust pose a high drift hazard and granules pose a low drift hazard. So I don't know how they'll pose that or state that question to you. But just keep that in mind as far as the drift goes. Again, we're still talking about dry formulations, but if we go over to page seven, you'll see wettable powder, denoted by W or WP. That's the primary product or uh, formulation, that, uh, type of formulation here in the dry formulations. That's wettable powders. Dry, finely ground formulations that look like dust 
Now, is a wettable powder and a dust the same thing? No. <laughs> but you would be surprised at how many people say, oh, I've got some of that uh, bug dust. Well, I'll just mix that in my sprayer. Now, what's going to happen when you put a dust in a sprayer? Nightmare, right? It, you're going to have a, basically a trash, you're going to have a sprayer in the trash cans, what you're going to have. It's going to clog it up when it gets dry, but it's amazing how many people think a dust and a wettable powder are the same thing. The difference, a dust, you dust on, a wettable powder, you actually mix in water and it forms a solution as long as you do what? Keep it agitated. Shake it up, mix it. And that's one of the main disadvantages of the wettable powder, and they may ask you that on the test, and it's, it's listed right there requires good and constant agitation in the spray tank because it'll quickly settle and then you, you're spraying, if your intake hose is high, you're pulling water and if it's low, you're pulling a high concentrate of the product which will settle out toward the bottom of the tank. So do keep that in mind. In addition, wettable powders sometimes clog nozzles and sometimes they'll leave a residue, so just keep those. They could be considered disadvantages for wettable powders. The last big group uh, remember, we had the dry formulations, we had the liquid formulations, and now we have the fumigants. Does anybody in here use a fumigant? Very rarely does anybody in a group like this, if I teach the class and there are 100 in the class, sometimes one hand will go up. Fumigants are pesticides that form poisonous gases when applied, sometimes for greenhouse use or maybe in a grain silo you have fumigants. Now why would a fumigant be especially dangerous? Yeah, it's gaseous. You may not smell it, you may not see it, but it's there. And then before you know it, you may be on the ground. So that's something to need. I'm glad nobody in here uses fumigants, actually, to tell you the truth. Advantages, toxic to a wide range of pests, can penetrate cracks, crevices, small areas. It, it penetrates well. Disadvantages, highly toxic to humans and all other living organisms, highly toxic, so they can be dangerous. The very last thing in this chapter that we want to talk about is the word adjuvant, adjuvant. It took me a little while to, to learn how to pronounce that word, adjuvant. Do you know what an adjuvant is? Uh, right under that bold term there, it tells you, and it'll probably ask you this on the test, an adjuvant is a chemical, another chemical, added to the pesticide formulation or tank mix to actually increase the effectiveness or safety of that pesticide product. So we're adding B to A to make A work better. And we have all different types of adjuvants. Some of them are listed over here on the right-hand column, the very last column in this chapter. We have wetting agents. They may ask you that on the test. This is an adjuvant that allows wettable powders to mix better with water, so they do a better job. We have emulsifiers. This is a common adjuvant that allows petroleum-based products, or ECs, to mix better with water. We have spreaders, stickers, cotton uh, growers and some row crop growers use spreaders and stickers so the pesticide when sprayed on a leaf surface, especially a rough surface, will stick to the surface and spread out, hence the name spreader, sticker. So we have several types of adjuvant. Just remember that an adjuvant is a chemical added to the pesticide mix to actually enhance the effects of that pesticide, make it work better, okay? So do remember the th three big broad groups, the liquid formulations and the dry formulations and the fumigants and so forth, and the active ingredient and the inactive ingredient make the formulation. Terms to know. If we go back over to the very, uh, very front beginning of this chapter under terms to know in the gray block, we'll check a couple off in this chapter. I'll always have a few for you in each chapter. Non-target, any site or organism other than the site or pest toward which uh, pesticide or control measures are being directed, non-site. And then target pest, the pest toward which control measures are being directed. A lot of these terms is just common, common sense uh, type definitions, so don't make it hard. Target pest, it just sounds what it sounds like, target pest, that's the pest toward which control measures are being directed. And non-target, do remember that one. So those are the two terms from this chapter. And we will now proceed along. Uh, if we want to turn over to chapter four, pesticides in the environment. When I started teaching this class back in 1988, I guess it was, the little training book that you have in your lap was about this thick. Now it's about this thick. Another few years, it'll probably be that thick. So we had to add some chapters, and this was one of the very first chapters we had to add to the original book, pesticides in the environment. So that's chapter four. We'll take a look at the video and then we will do a little bit of review on that chapter.
pesticides in the environment. The environment is everything that's around us. It's more than the oceans and ozone layer. It is the air, water, plants, animals, buildings, and all that's around them. A responsible applicator will follow good practices that result in effective pest control with little risk to the environment. What we do affects the environment. And of course, the quality of the environment will ultimately affect us. Protecting the environment starts with the pesticide label. It has a section on the environmental hazards for each pesticide. EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, is taking a closer look at environmental risks and the benefits to society as it considers new applications for registration and existing pesticide registrations. Hazard to humans has been a major reason many pesticides have been classified for restricted use. Now, more and more pesticide labels list other environmental effects, such as potential for groundwater contamination, as a reason for restriction. There are two general sources of contamination from pesticides. These are point source and non-point source contamination. Point source pollution comes from a specific identifiable site, such as an improperly run cleaning, mixing, or disposal site. A pesticide spill or a pesticide warehouse fire would be a point source contamination. Non-point source pollution comes from a wide area, such as the movement of pesticides into streams or groundwater after broadcast applications. Shown here is drift, another type of non-point source pollution. Drift occurs when pesticide spray droplets, particles, or vapors move off the target area into non-target areas. Contamination from pesticides could be particularly harmful in certain areas. Examples of sensitive areas outside include schools, playgrounds, hospitals, aquatic areas, ornamental gardens, food or feed crops, and apiaries. Sensitive areas indoors include where people, especially children, pregnant women, the elderly or the sick, live, work, or are cared for, and areas where food is processed, prepared, stored, or served. Typical pesticide labeling statements that alert you to these concerns include remove all animals from building prior to treatment and keep animals out until spray is dried, or applications prohibited in areas where food is held, processed, prepared, or served. Pesticides that move off the intended target can damage the environment. Pesticides move in several ways, including in the air through drift, in water by runoff or leaching, or on plants, animals, or objects that move or are moved off-site. Drift can be decreased by lowering pump pressure and using larger nozzle openings. Pesticides tend to drift less when released close to the ground than when applied upward, as in orchard spraying, or when applied from above, as by an aircraft. This ash tree shows damage from drift of pesticide vapors. The labeling of volatile pesticides often includes statements warning about drift. Pesticides can enter water through air drift or runoff from nearby applications. This fish kill was caused by runoff. Improper disposal of pesticides or excessive rain or irrigation on treated fields can cause pesticides to leach into groundwater. A label may alert you to guard against drift or runoff by such statements as maintain a buffer zone of 100 feet from bodies of water or this product is water soluble and can move with surface runoff water. Do not contaminate cropland, water, or irrigation ditches. Pesticides can move away from the release area on protective clothing or on animal and food products. There are legal limits or tolerances for how much pesticide residue may safely remain on crops and animal products. 
products that exceed this tolerance are illegal. A typical label statement to alert you to these concerns would be, do not apply within five days of harvest. Pesticides can cause harm from direct contact to non-target organisms, such as honeybees, to the environment due to persistence and accumulation, and to surfaces by staining or causing corrosion. Label statements may alert you to harmful effects from direct contact, such as phytotoxicity to some plants or extreme toxicity to fish. A warning may be seasonal, such as do not apply this product or allow it to drift to blooming crops or weeds if bees are visiting the treatment area. Typical label statements to warn you of harmful effects on inanimate surfaces include do not spray on plastic, painted, or varnished surfaces, or may cause pitting of automobile and other vehicle paint. Pesticides usually break down into harmless components over time. This breakdown is affected by surface type and moisture, presence of microorganisms, temperature, and sunlight. Some pesticides persist in soil for long periods of time and resist chemical and microbial breakdown. Avoid using these pesticides if you have an alternative chemical or other pest control method. You can help keep our environment free of pollution. Aside from following the law, it has its own rewards. Pesticides in the environment, that's what we're gonna talk about right now. So if you wanna turn over to that chapter, chapter four, what is the environment? A lot of times that pops up on the test. Before, again, before I started doing this way back, environment, I thought, well, mountains, lakes, like we just looked at, pretty scenes. Well, that's part of the environment. The environment is everything that is around us. It's everything. It's that machine that's not working right. It's this pencil. It's me. It's you. It's everything. And that usually pops up on the test. What is the environment? It's everything. So don't don't think it's just pretty things like the mountains and trees and clouds and all that. It's everything. So that's why we have to be very careful when we use pesticides because we're going to affect everything in the environment. On page three, they talk about something you'll need to know. Sources of contamination, point source pollution, and non-point source pollution. And that's going to pop up on the test, I can just about guarantee you. Point source pollution comes from a specific identifiable place. There's no question about it. A few years ago when the Millican plant LaGrange burned, carpet plant burned for days, we didn't have any problems identifying where that Channel 2 flew over their helicopter over, where that uh, problem was coming from. That was an example of point source pollution. Right there is where it was coming from, from that factory that was on fire, that was burning. That's an example of point source pollution. It comes from a specific identifiable place. There's no question about it. Non-point source pollution is, is a little bit tougher. We don't know exactly where it comes from. We know we have pollution, and we know it occurred, and we can monitor it, and we can measure it. But it may be from the crop duster or the flyover that occurred five miles up the river, 10 miles up the river. Then it got into the water, down the stream, and then off in a pool. It occurred somewhere, somehow, but the plane's gone, the pilot's gone, everything's gone, but here's the pesticide. So there's some questions as to well, where did this come from? That's an example of non-point source. We're not quite sure. We can trace it back usually and find out, but that's non-point source pollution. Also in this chapter, they may ask you uh, to define a sensitive area. Those are sites or living things that are easily injured by pesticides sensitive areas and we have certain outdoor sensitive areas and we have certain indoor sensitive areas uh, schools playgrounds habitats of endangered species honeybee sites um, apiaries etc those are all examples of outdoor sensitive areas indoor sensitive areas might be places where people uh, especially children pregnant women the, elderly, the sick, or where they live, or where they're cared for, areas where food or food products feed is processed, prepared, uh, examples, that would be an example of an indoor sensitive area. So we have outdoor sensitive areas and indoor sensitive areas, okay? Over on page five, we talk about pesticide movement away from the release site. Remember we talked about target and non-target in the last chapter? 
pesticide movement as it blow as pesticides move away from the target in the air through wind movement and currents, uh, air currents, what would that be called? Drift. They'll probably ask you that on the test. And this is an example now, something I think I've repeated it three times. Todd and the others will probably mention it too. Is that just a giveaway that you're probably going to be asked for a definition of drift? Also, pesticides can move in the water. And if they move along the surface, what's that called? You'll need to know that because that's probably going to be on the test. Runoff. Moves along the surface, say you're out on the golf course and the pesticide moves along the fairway, hits a bunker, then it actually starts going down through the soil. What's that called? Leaching. That's probably going to be on the test too. So pesticide movement through the air, drift, runoff, and then leaching as it goes down through the soil. Okay? Um, over on page seven, they talk about, there's a definition called phytotoxic. It may be a little hard to see, but it's, it's right down here in the corner, right-hand corner of page seven. If you don't have a book, just remember these uh, terms and, and things we're talking about up here that I am in the video. Phytotoxic, you can break that word down, phyto, plant, toxic, harmful to, harmful to plants. So you probably already knew that, but that usually pops up on the exam, phytotoxic harmful to plants. Um, if we turn over to page eight, they talk about persistent pesticides. This is in the left column down near the bottom, persistent pesticides. Pesticides that leave residues that stay in the environment without breaking down for long, long periods of time. And they listed a few of them up here. And I'm sure some of you have been around long enough to remember chlordane and aldrin and heptachlor and dildrin. Those were some of the products we used for termite control, termaticides. We wanted those products to stay in the soil. Well, they're gone now. All those old termaticides are gone. We have new products. But that's an example of persistent pesticide, a product or pesticide that leaves a residue in the soil for a long time. Okay. We go back to the very beginning of this chapter, uh, pesticides in the environment, but we look on the back page here under the gray block called Terms to Know. Just a couple of other terms, labeling, this has popped up several times now, the pesticide product label and all other information